Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1980 film Fade to Black. And when I'm doing this review, it's available for streaming on the Shutter streaming service. Uh, so you can check it out there. Now, it was written and directed by Vernon Zimmerman, who's done the films Deadhead Miles and The Unholy Rollers, which I have not seen. But if you have, put some comments down here. Let me know if they're worth checking out. Uh, he did a good job with the directing. The directing looks good. The acting is, is good for the most part. A few not so great ones here and there, but uh, it stars Denner, uh, Dennis Christopher as Eric Binford, who obviously focuses very much on the character of Eric Binford. It's all about him, pretty much. Although there are other characters in it, some of them feel like they make sense there, but I would argue that the character of Dr. Moriarty and the police officers, even though they get a little bit of screen time, they don't really make sense in the film because they're kind of barely there, and to have them in as much as they are just feels weird because it's more than you would assume for just being an idea in the film, which is what they basically should have been with how focused it is on Eric Benford, but not enough to be real characters in the film. And they kind of end up feeling, especially with Dr. Moriarty, like they shouldn't even be there. Like they don't matter at all. And they're not very well written either. So that's one of my big issues with the film. But anyway, Dennis Christopher was in the films Blood and Lace, Doppelganger, in five episodes of the show Deadwood, which I actually just started watching for the first time, so that's funny. Uh, Django Unchained, and he was also in the It TV series from the 90s, uh, so that was interesting. Uh, that's just a few of his. Now, this film was actually nominated for some Saturn Awards, but it ended up failing commercially. But since then, it's actually gained a cult following, which... Not a big surprise, there are a lot of, you know, 80s films uh, and even further back that have done that, 70s, 80s, 90s mainly, uh, have, you know, had a resurgence, and this is no exception. Uh, Eric's film obsession in this, in this movie is heavily established in the very beginning, and they need to do that pretty much because that's what it's about, obviously. It's about Eric Benford being so obsessed with film and immersing himself in it so much that it starts him down this spiral where he loses touch with who he actually is. And he basically takes on these roles of these characters in film. But it seems like he's he only does it for bad reasons. It's never to, like, benefit out of life. It's only to enact revenge and do violent things, basically. And they lay the track pretty well for it, because obviously in the beginning you see he's... You know, talking about film a lot, he's watching film a lot, you see his room, that's one of the most important things for the setup, is you see just movie stuff just covering at almost every inch of his wall, and even in his bathroom at one point that you see. So it gives you a really good immediate visual idea that he is obsessed with film. You know, it's not just fandom, like having a little bit of stuff here and there, like, you know, someone like me, it is obsession because it covers everything. Um... Uh, also, you have to notice at Eric's job that there was a Halloween poster up behind uh, Burger when he's talking to him, and also a tourist trap poster, and I'm wondering if that had to do with the fact that I believe Charles Band did some work on this film, so I'm wondering if that's why the tourist trap uh, poster was up there. I don't know, but um, you get the idea between his home life in the beginning and his job life that he's just getting bullied in life in general. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of one of the main points of this film is that Eric feels like a nobody. Like, he is pretty much a nobody in his life. You know, he doesn't get respect at home from his aunt, who's actually, you know, you find out at the end, who's actually his mother and wouldn't even tell him the truth about that. And she's even made up her own, you know, uh, delusions about who she is as a person. And then also, obviously, her relationship to Eric so she's bullying him at home, making him feel terrible, and then he goes to work, and he can't get away from it there because his, you know, his boss is a bully to him, the other guys that he works with are a bully to him, uh, one of them, Richie, played by Mickey Rourke, by the way, which is interesting to see him in that role, but it's just terrible, like his life is so bad, and he feels so much like a nobody, that his immersion in, in these films it's like he's living an alternate reality. He's able to experience being someone else by being so obsessed and so involved with those films. And then with, you know, whatever he may have a mental illness from the get-go, which I would argue maybe comes from his, his aunt, his actual mother, because you see that she's 
created in her mind a different reality like she's not living a real life she's created a whole lot of fake stuff in her life you find out towards the end that maybe there's a genetic mental illness at play here but regardless all these other societal things have kind of worked to push him over the edge and throw him into the films and with as much as he immersed his himself into the films when things are at their worst for his life it's like the films then come out through him so it's the it's basically he consumes the films and then he, his life gets to such a bad point that the films then are coming back and they're inhabiting his body to the point where he doesn't even recognize himself as Eric Binford at one point. And there are a few moments where you see, um, you know, the, the characters that he's consumed so much are taking his body over basically, but he, you get these little glimpses of the actual Eric Binford showing back up. Like after he kills his aunt and um, he has a moment where he kind of realizes what just happened and he's crying in the bathroom or um, there was, there was one other moment at least where he kind of like snaps back to reality, but it becomes less and less. And then you just see him spiraling further and further down and just inhabiting these other different characters from film until you, you know, you get to the end and he, he even says there's who's Eric Benford. I don't even know who this Eric Benford is. And it seems like a lot of the characters he's actually inhabiting have to do with Cagney specifically the actor. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, Eric's vision of the girl in the diner as Marilyn Monroe is your first indicator that he's not firmly living in reality and his film obsession is actually becoming unhealthy. That is your first indicator that that is kind of where this path is headed with the film, and it was set up pretty well. Uh, when he thinks about violence toward a person, it manifests as a violent sequence in his mind from a film. That's kind of the inkling showing up that he will draw from violence in film to enact violence in reality. It's In the beginning, it's just showing up in his head as thoughts, and then eventually it becomes actions he actually takes. So he's holding it back in the beginning, like the part where he you know, has a clip of someone smacking a woman, um, and that's when he had a bad exchange with his aunt. Uh, and then he also has that sort of thing happen, I think, when he was dealing with Richie at one point had a similar type thing but he holds those things back he's maintaining at that point until he reaches his breaking point and then it's like he can't stop it and instead of him thinking about those sequences they come out of his body as actual real life violence and i find that an interesting concept with the film which is why I, overall i like the film um because it's it's an interesting concept uh i talked about dr moriarty not feeling like he's a character that matters and to go along with that, the scene where he's playing the harmonica, like, what is that? Like, he's, A, he's a character that doesn't really matter that much and doesn't have much screen time. So, B, why are you going to put a scene in for that specific character that doesn't mean anything? Like, it's, and then it's weird because it's like his, his harmonica playing seduces Officer Oshimbol who he can't even remember her name later after he's already slept with her. It's just like that whole sequence there, It you don't need it in the film. It does absolutely nothing. It's pointless and dumb. It seems like it's leftovers from something else they were planning on putting in the film, but ended up not doing. So it just, it shouldn't be there. Uh, you definitely end up feeling for Eric in this, especially if you're somewhat of a cinephile, because as people are kind of cinephiles like myself, uh, you've all been to that place where either someone in your family or friends or other people you don't know have told you, you know, your obsession with film or your interest in film. It's just such a waste of time. You could be doing something else with your life. And Eric ends up getting that a lot. You know, he gets it from his aunt. He gets it from uh, other people. Um, and, you know, you can kind of feel for that. But also just seeing him bullied the way that he is, it also makes you feel for him. So it's an interesting setup for that reason. But by the end... You know, you're just kind of like, he's gone. Like, the, the Eric that you were feeling for isn't there anymore. He's inhabited by the psychosis, basically, the these films coming out as violence. When Eric reaches his breaking point and kills his aunt, aunt, it's like the movies take over and Eric's barely there. He even refers to himself at that point. This is the first time he refers to himself as someone else. He calls himself Cody Jarrett, which apparently is a name of a character from Cagney um so yeah and they talk about that later Dr. Moriarty does uh his reality becomes a mix of the movies he loves 
brought into the world through his actions. Uh, the scene where he starts painting his face because he does himself up kind of like Bela Lugosi as Dracula, really interesting visual when it's only half of it. I thought that was a really awesome visual where half of it is him as a black and white character in film. And then the other half was just him. Um, a, it's visually very appealing and it's very cool. And the fact that they start from like the normal side and then it slowly moves and you see the split and then the black and white side that's kind of a symbolic movement of him transitioning from the real life eric binford to transitioning to the film characters and them just being who he is from that point out and even so much so obviously that he ends up doing some really crazy stuff uh you can tell eric will go further in this film violence wise when he ends up sitting forward and becoming even more engrossed in Night of the Living Dead in the theater at the very violent part, the most violent part and shocking part with the uh, the girl zombie with the trowel just doing the stabbing on, I believe it was her mother. It's been a while since I've seen it. but um, And that's what leads him on to then going after the prostitute. And, you know, he doesn't actually kill her, but then going that extra step of when she accidentally dies drinking her blood like he's embodying the character of Dracula that he's dressed up as. Uh, I like the recreation of the psycho shower scene. I thought that was cool and funny at the same time. And the fact that instead of blood going down the drain, it's actually ink. Now, I do think at that point he says, I just wanted your autograph. But I think that he was actually planning on killing her because I only saw the pen. And it seemed like he was actually holding it like he was going to stab her. But that he kind of gets... Um, snap back to being Eric, I think, in that moment because of the girl's scream, because of Marilyn's scream. That's that moment that this kind of snaps him back. So I thought that was interesting. Um, Eric killing Richie as a gunslinger is actually a really wacky scene. It's kind of a fun scene because it's so wacky, but at the same time, it makes the film at that moment seem a, seem a little more ridiculous, um, whereas the, the scenes prior to that don't do that. I would say also seeming a little bit ridiculous um, along with the gunslinger scene is like the gangster scene he does just because of the impression that he does of a gangster. It's just funny how he voices that. So those two scenes make it a little bit ridiculous and wacky. Uh, it took way too long in this film to come back to Moriarty. That's the other thing. Like I was saying that he's, it seems like he's a character that doesn't really matter and he's kind of even barely there, but there's also this huge chunk of time that passes since you last saw him and then they bring him back and it's like a short scene and you're just like why are you even coming back to him at this point like at this point just drop it because he doesn't matter it's clearly focused on eric benford you don't need these other characters eric's detachment from reality takes the next step when he's trying to see marilyn monroe when she's been dead for almost two decades when he's outside taking photos and then talking to that guy at that um restaurant that little like diner on the side and he's just like have you ever seen marilyn monroe come out of the building and he's just like dude she's been dead for years and then he like flips out because the guy's trying to break hit his new reality basically but you see that's that next step of him just being gone at that point Funny how Eric literally scares Berger to death, his boss. Uh, I like how they set up that whole scene where it was, you know, the lights going out and him getting kind of like chased around and he's dressed up as the mummy. It's a cool scene. It works really well. And then the fact that he doesn't even kill him, he literally scares him to death, which I thought was a cool concept for it. Uh, once again, Eric's gangster impression is really funny. Maybe one of my favorite moments of the film, also how he just, you know, goes in broad daylight, not even covering his face and shoots up the guy, which speaks to how much it's not Eric anymore and he's living in the movies, basically. Um, Moriarty's statement that Eric is a victim of society is kind of true because of, you know, stuff I already talked about, the bullying that ends up happening, but also the whole situation of He's so much in a, in a part of his life where, like I was saying, he doesn't feel like he's anybody. And with movies I, idealizing life and giving people this idea that you can be this and you can be that. And it fills people's heads with ideas of grandiosity. And it kind of goes to something that I talk about all the time as being a problem with movie and t movies and TV when it comes to romance. The way that romance is portrayed in film is 
is not true to life. You know, it's always this like, when you meet the person, you'll feel sparks and it's fireworks. And then the relationship will be perfect throughout decades. And you'll never have to work on any issues. And it sets people up for an unrealistic expectation of what they're getting into. And then when people buy into that because they've seen it so much, they can't work through real problems in a relationship without feeling like the relationship is hopeless or needs to be thrown out or pointless. So um, this film kind of speaks to that type of thing that I kind of talk about all the time in real life. So the ending of this film seems kind of too drawn out. And to be honest, the whole film, it's like an hour and 40 minute runtime for the most part. And it doesn't have enough story for that, in my opinion. They draw it out too much. It definitely should have been cut down. Like I was saying before, cut out the Dr. Moriarty stuff for sure. But the end just goes on a little bit too long. They should have cut that down as well. It's a good ending, but yeah, should have been cut down. Uh, when he keeps saying all these characters' names at the end, when he's on the roof of the Chinese uh, theater, um, it's the showing that he, you know, he's flashing through these characters basically. Like he, this is this is his moment before death, and he's just reliving all these films like quickly before he ends up dying. And it's also a more um, strong indicator of what I was saying before of him having been a nobody wanting to feel like somebody. And he went through all these characters. And then at the end, as his life is flashing before his eyes and he's about to die, all these characters are flashing in. He's like, I'm this character, I'm this character, I'm this character. And it's his, also his way of trying to say that he became something, that like he reached a point of being a somebody at that point instead of remaining a nobody. So I think for that reason, it is kind of a powerful ending to it. Um, Eric's gradual spiral away from reality is well-paced throughout the film, and it is done in interesting ways, um, mainly being the characters he becomes and how the kills happen. So I did like that. Um, yeah, and that's basically all I had to say about this film. Like I said, it's definitely worth watching once to experience it's interesting. I might watch it a second time just to see if I can pick up on some things I may have missed on it. Uh, missed within it but um overall it's a good film it's not a wonderful film or a great film like i said already covered it there are problems with it but uh, i would recommend it so out of five stars with half stars in play i'm gonna go ahead and give it a 3.5 i think a three and a half is is right on for this film so uh let me know in the comments if you've seen this film what your thoughts on it are as well obviously we can talk spoilers in the comments, but I want to hear your opinions. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Were you in between? All opinions welcome. But do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button. Uh, it means a lot to me when people subscribe. I'm not do making money doing this or anything. I'm doing it for the love of horror. And if you love horror and if you like any of my videos, I appreciate it if you pay me back by just hitting the subscribe button. And if you do subscribe, make sure you also hit the notification bell just to make sure that you know when I'm putting up new movie review videos or unboxing videos or live stream. I am start live streaming because you get a notification for that. But yeah, I would appreciate that. But anyway, regardless, thanks for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.